Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Infection Control Reminders during respiratory virus season. Thought that song was a good intro uh, as we get out of this, uh, this these freezing temperatures, right? Okay, uh, so this session is a repeat from the fall presentation. And this information is, we found it to be very important and we wanted to offer it again during, while we are in the thick of respiratory virus season. This session is brought to you by Project First Line Rhode Island under the Center for Acute Infectious Disease and Epidemiology at the Rhode Island Department of Health in partnership with the CDC. I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy day and joining me today. And I also wanna thank you for your dedication and care that you deliver to our community and your healthcare roles. Before I introduce myself, I want to direct your attention to the chat box to find the link to our pre-session survey. This pre-session survey must be completed at this time if you would like to get CNE, CE, or certificate of training for this session. So please take a minute to fill it out if you haven't already, because as we undergo with this um, presentation, the survey will no longer be available. And in the next slide, I'm going to go over the continuing ed requirements. Uh, my name is Lisa Ledoux. For those of you who do not know me, I'm an infection prevention training liaison with Project First Line Rhode Island. I've been a nurse for over 32 years, uh, and I'm pl really pleased to be um, sharing this information with you today. And I, um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kearney, um, and she can come on camera and introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're excited to have you here. I'm Alexis Kearney. I'm the Consultant Medical Director for Project First Line Rhode Island um, and a practicing physician. I'm happy to have you and please put your questions in the chat as we go through the presentation. And Abby will be posting information for you throughout the webinar via chat. And the Project First Line team is behind the scenes in support of this webinar today. Okay, so here are the continuing education criteria for those of you who are attending and would like to receive CNE credit. This is approximately a 45 minute session that's approved for one contact hour. This nursing, continuing, this nursing continuing professional development activity is approved by the Northeast Multi-State Division Education Unit and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. So in order to receive your CNE credit, these four steps must be completed. Step one, if you haven't already done so, please complete that pre-session survey. Step two, the second step is attending this live webinar, which you are all here with me. Step three, uh, you must complete the post-session survey after this training ends. And the post-session survey will be emailed to you tomorrow. And step four, you must complete the post-session quiz. A link to the quiz will also be emailed to you tomorrow. For our healthcare colleagues here today who are opting for a certificate of training, um, EMS continuing ed and dental IPC continuing education, steps one to three are required, whereas step four is strictly optional for you. So being sick is never fun, and that's especially true if you're not ready for it. We've all been there shuffling down a pharmacy or a grocery aisle feeling awful, looking for cold medicine products or looking for chicken noodle soup. Preparing for a respiratory season is not only about stocking up on tissues and cough drops. As frontline workers, healthcare staff play a crucial role in protecting patients, coworkers, and themselves from getting sick, especially during respiratory virus season. As we are currently in the thick of respiratory virus season, it is more important than ever to emphasize infection control in our healthcare settings. As healthcare workers, you need to be prepared, and it's important to have awareness of what types of respiratory viruses are circulating right now, what are the symptoms of these particular viruses, and who's at risk of getting sick. Respiratory virus season doesn't have an official start or end date, and because of this, it's important to be prepared. Last year's respiratory virus season saw a considerable spread of that triple-demic of COVID-19, the flu, and RSV, which led to extra stress in an already overwhelmed healthcare system. And most um, local community hospitals are overwhelmed due to a combination of factors, the prevalence of these respiratory viruses, lack of inpatient beds, and lack of some staff. Regardless of your healthcare setting or which respiratory viruses are spreading in your community, there are existing infection control measures you can take to slow the spread of these uh, res respiratory viruses and protect again yourself and your patients. When respiratory viruses are spreading in the community, the risk for spread in healthcare settings increases as well. The intention of this session is to remind you that there are things that you can do there are infection prevention actions you can take as a healthcare worker to prevent the spread of viral and respiratory infections in healthcare. So here is our agenda. Uh, we just did our welcome introductions. We will review the learning objectives for this re refresher session. 
We're going to go over the common respiratory viruses that are currently circulating this respiratory season. Infection control actions that you as healthcare workers, workers can take to protect yourself. We're going to have a, a quick reflection, go over key takeaways. Um, I have just some small announcements and then there'll be an end of session feedback and we'll go into our Q&A. Okay, so our learning objectives. You'll be able to identify common respiratory viruses and how they spread and cause infection. Understand the impact of increased respiratory virus rates in our healthcare system and review infection control actions used to protect ourselves and our patients. So we're going to start with the knowledge check. And um, you'll be seeing me have these a few of these throughout the session. Um, this is a true or false statement. So um, if you could please put your answers in the chat box. Respiratory virus infections occur year round. Is this statement true or false? So again, I invite you to put your answers in the chat box. Is this true or false? Respiratory virus infections occur year round. All right, I'm seeing a lot of you putting some answers. Great. All right, and the answer is true. Excellent, good job. Yes. Respiratory virus infections can occur year round. Germs live in reservoirs in and out our bodies. One reservoir where germs live in the body is in the respiratory system. The respiratory system consists of upper and lower airway. The upper airway includes our nose, our throat, our trachea, also known as our windpipe. And the lower airway includes our lungs. Many germs live in the upper airway. Germs in the nose and mouth can easily be spread to the skin and hands when you touch your face. And then from there, they can spread on surfaces and to other people. When an infected person talks, breathes, sneezes, or coughs, they produce respiratory droplets that could spread germs. Germs are more likely to spread in places with poor ventilation or closed in areas with many people. So now that we know that respiratory viruses can occur year round, what is a respiratory infection? A respiratory tract infection is an infection of the lungs, airway, sinuses, or throat. And as we said, these can occur year round. However, there's a significant increase in these infections during fall and winter months, known as the cold and flu season, when people tend to spend more time indoors and in enclosed areas. During cold and flu season, it helps to know the types of common viruses, their symptoms, and how to avoid spreading illness to those around you. So learning to recognize infection risks in healthcare means learning to identify moments throughout your workday when there's an opportunity for germs to spread and make people sick. To recognize these opportunities, we need to know where germs live, their reservoirs, how they can get from place to place or people or from person to person and cause these infections, and it's through pathways. When we refer to pathways of infection, we refer to what you see on, on the slide, touch, splashes and sprays, clinical care, and breathed in. The first pathway is touch. And that usually involves the skin, especially the hands, but it also happens with shared devices. When, when you touch different people and different surfaces, germs could spread by touch via a handshake. Touching an object such as a cell phone, keyboard, door handle, or any medical devices. Another pathway is through splashes and sprays. And that could be splashes and sp sprays of blood and body fluids. Germs in those splashes or sprays can get into a person's eyes, nose, or mouth, or into a cut or a break in their skin and cause infection. And a third pathway for germs to spread in healthcare is through clinical care. They're tasks that bypass or break down the body's natural defenses. Performing a clinical task that creates a pathway for germs to enter the patient's body. And that could be done by, you know, IV insertion or inserting a, a, a Foley catheter or a dressing change. And the last common pathway for germs to spread is through respiratory, respiratory particles that are breathed in. Exhaling of infectious respiratory particles can be done by sneezing or coughing, singing, or even laughing. Okay, so now we know the pathways. Let's, now we're going to start talking about the viruses that we're going to go over today. The common respiratory viruses we're going to discuss are RSV, flu, and COVID-19. These respiratory infections are all highly contagious. It is possible for a person to be infected with multiple viruses at the same time. And while these respiratory viruses are more common in the respiratory season, they can also circulate in different times of the year and cause severe illness to people with underlying illnesses or weakened immune systems. Okay, so the first virus, the respiratory syncytial virus, also referred to as RSV. It's a common respiratory virus that usually causes mild, cold-like symptoms. Most people recover in a week or two, but RSV can be serious. Commonly, some think that this infection only affects babies or young children, and that is not correct. RSV can affect any age. 
The next common respiratory virus, influenza, also referred to as the flu. While, while seasonal influenza viruses are detected year round in the United States, flu viruses typically circulate during the fall and winter during what's known as the flu season. The exact timing and duration of flu season varies, but flu activity often begins to increase in October. And most of the time flu um, activity peaks between December and February. And in some cases it can last as late as May. And the last virus we're gonna discuss is SARS-CoV-2, also referred to as COVID-19, which we're all very well aware of, and the coronavirus disease of 2019. This virus is very well known to us and it can be very contagious and spreads quickly. All of these viruses have very similar symptoms and they can cause mild to severe illness depending on the age and the health status of the individual. And depending on the severity of symptoms, hospitalization may be required. So we're gonna dig more into each uh, virus as we get into this. Okay, so we're gonna start with RSV. RSV is increasingly recognized as an important public health concern. There was a surge of RSV infections this past November of 2023 that overwhelmed hospitals. Since then, there has been a slow decline of reported cases. RSV is the most frequent cause of bronchiolitis, which is an inflammation of the small airway in the lung of infants, and it's responsible for more respiratory complications and casualties than COVID-19 or the flu in children. Most people who get RSV infection will have mild illness and will recover in a week or two. Some people, however, are more likely to develop severe RSV infections and may need to be hospitalized, and antibiotics do not help in treating RSV. RSV can spread when an infected person coughs or sneezes. You can get the virus droplets from a cough or sneeze in your eyes, nose, or mouth. Um, when you have direct contact with the virus, such as kissing the face of a child with RSV, you touch a surface that has virus on it, like a doorknob, and then touch your face before washing your hands. RSV can survive on many, it could survive for many hours on hard surfaces, such as tables or crib rails, it typically lives on soft surfaces such as tissues and hands for shorter amounts of time. And people infected with RSV are usually contagious for three to eight days and may become contagious a day or two before they start showing signs and symptoms. And RSV can also make chronic health problems a lot worse. So who's at risk for RSV? RSV can be dangerous for some infants and young children. Each year in the United States, an estimated 60,000 children younger than five years old are hospitalized due to RSV infection. Almost all children will have an RSV infection by their second birthday, whether it be mild symptoms or severe symptoms. Some infants and people with weakened immune systems can continue to spread the virus even after they stop showing symptoms for as long as four weeks. Children are often exposed to and infected with RSV outside of the home, such as in schools or child care centers or the pediatrician's office. They can then transmit the virus to other members of the family. And those at greatest risk for severe illness from RSV include premature infants, infants, especially those six months, about six months old and younger, young children with congenital um, heart or chronic lung disease, young children with compromised immune system due to a medical condition or medical treatment, or children with neuromuscular disease disorders. RSV infections can also be dangerous for certain adults. Each year, it's estimated that between 60,000 and 160,000 older adults in the United States are hospitalized and 6,000 to 10,000 die due to RSV infections. RSV can exacerbate pre-existing respiratory conditions in adults and may cause serious respiratory illness in the elderly. Adults at high risk for severe RSV include older, older adults, older population, adults with chronic heart or lung disease, ones who have immu immu I'm sorry, weakened immune systems, and adults with certain underlying medical conditions, and also those that are living in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Okay, so here is our RSV knowledge check. And again, these are um, statements true or false. So I'll ask a question and please, I offer, I ask you to participate, put your answers in the chat. So first question or statement, I'm sorry. RSV affects only infants and children. Is this true or false? Nice. Okay, and that answer is false. Good job, excellent. 
Second, antibiotics are helpful in treating RSV. Is that true or false? Well, thank you all for participating. This is great. And the answer to that is false. And third, RSV infection sent approximately 60,000 young children under the age of five years old to the hospital yearly in the United States. Is that true or false? All right. Excellent job. And that answer is true. All right. Good job. Thanks. So let's move on. Influenza, the flu. The flu is a contagious respiratory illness caused by influenza viruses that infects, it infects the nose, the throat, and sometimes the lungs. It can cause mild to severe illness and at times can lead to death. Influenza virus spreads easily during the winter months when people spend time together indoors. There are four different types of influenza viruses, A, B, C, and D. Influenza A and B viruses cause seasonal epidemics of disease in people known as the flu season almost every winter in the United States. Influenza A viruses are the only influenza viruses known to cause flu pandemics, you know, global epidemics. And uh, a pandemic can occur when, when a new and different influenza A virus emerges that infects people and has the ability to spread efficiently among people and against which people have little or no immunity. Influenza C virus infections generally cause mild illness and they're not thought to cause human epidemics. And last, influenza D viruses primarily affect cattle with spillover to other animals, but are not known to infect people or cause illness. The virus is transmitted easily from person to person by tiny droplets made when people with flu cough, sneeze, or talk. These droplets can lead I'm sorry, these droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby. It is not that common that a person might get the flu by touching a surface or object that has flu virus on it and then touching their own mouth or nose. Most infected people do recover within one to two weeks without requiring medical attention. So who's at risk for the flu? All age groups can be affected, but there are groups that are more at risk than others. Anyone can get flu, even healthy people. And serious problems related to the flu can happen at any age, but some people are at higher risk of developing serious flu-related complications if they get sick. And this includes people 65 years or older, um, people of any age with certain chronic medical conditions, you know, such as asthma, diabetes, or heart disease, pregnant people, and children um, younger than five years old. Also, healthcare workers, they're at high risk of acquiring influenza virus infection due to increased exposure to the patients. And then they risk spreading that uh, this um, virus to vulnerable indi individuals as they're caring for their patients. However, in the very uh, young, the elderly, and those with other serious medical conditions, infection can lead to severe complications of the underlying condition, you know, in pneumonia. And it can, like I said, it can lead to death. So here's our knowledge check for the flu. And again, I participate, put the answers in the chat. Okay, first statement. You can spread flu to others even before symptoms appear. Is that true or false? Great. And that answer is true. Good job. You guys are doing 100% here. Second, flu illness can be more severe for certain people. Is that true or false? And that answer, that is true, right? Right, so if people have underlying illnesses, it could be much more severe. And last, number three, there is only one strain of the flu. Is that true or false? All right, and that, good job. That answer, it's false, good job. That's right, we just went over all the different types of flu viruses. All right, good job. Now we're on our last virus, COVID-19, the coronavirus disease of 2019, and it's caused by SARS-CoV-2. And we know it can be very contagious and spreads very quickly. COVID-19 most often causes respiratory symptoms that can feel much like a cold, the flu, or pneumonia. COVID-19 may attack more than your lungs and respiratory system. Other parts of your body may also be affected by this disease. And many people with COVID-19 have mild symptoms, but some can become severely ill as we know. Some people 
have no symptoms at all, but others become so sick that they need to be, you know, hospitalized and may even have to be put on a ventilator and a breathing machine. COVID-19 spreads when an infected person breathes out droplets and very small particles that contain the virus. Other people can breathe in those droplets and particles, or those droplets and particles can land on, you know, land in their eyes, on in their in their nose or mouth. And in some circumstances, these droplets may contaminate surfaces that they touch. Anyone infected with COVID-19 can spread it, even if they don't have any symptoms. So who's at risk for COVID-19? The risk of developing dangerous symptoms of COVID-19 may be increased in people who are 65 years and older. The risk may be um, increased in people of any age who have other serious health problems, as all the other viruses too, with underlying heart or lung conditions, weakened immune systems, obesity, diabetes, pregnant people, and children five years old and younger that have chronic health conditions. Each of these factors can increase the risk of severe COVID-19 symptoms, but people who have several of these health problems are at even higher risk. Okay, so this is our last knowledge check for COVID-19. All right, first one, first statement. COVID-19 is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. Is this true or false? Okay, I could see the answers and everybody's putting down true and the answer is true. Good job. Oh, there it goes. Okay, number two. Anyone infected with COVID-19 can spread it, even if they do not have symptoms. Is this true or false? And the answer to that is, whoops, there it goes. It's true, right? Anyone with COVID-19 can spread it, right? They don't have to have symptoms. And the last, COVID-19 does not spread easily. Is that true or false? All right, and the answer to that is false. We know it spreads very easily. All right, good job and thank you for participating. So here are the symptoms, RSV versus flu versus COVID-19. Symptoms of all of these viruses are more similar than they are different. They may look different in different age groups, all have similar treatments that are based upon supportive care, including comfort measures, and assuring adequate hydration. And on the slide, the highlighted symptoms are the ones that are more specific to that particular virus. So RSV, people infected with RSV usually show, like I think I mentioned earlier, they show symptoms within four to six days after getting infected. And these symptoms usually appear in stages, not all at once. In the very young infants with RSV, the only symptoms may be irritability, decreased activity, and, and then leads to some breathing difficulties. Uh, most symptoms of RSV are similar to the flu, COVID, and, and I'm sorry, RSV, um, most symptoms of RSV are similar to flu and COVID symptoms, except the highlighted ones. So what you see right there on that slide, decrease in appetite, sneezing, wheezing, dehydration. So that stands out more with RSV. The flu, flu signs and symptoms usually come on suddenly. People who are sick with flu often feel more uh, often feel some or even all of those symptoms that you see right up there. In COVID-19, same symptoms, but what makes COVID-19 different is the symptom of that new loss of taste and smell. Um, and some people may have vomiting and diarrhea, though that's more common in children than adults. And shortness of breath from RSV is more common in infants um, and young children. So do you think you have a respiratory virus? It is difficult to, de de to determine which respiratory virus it might be. And here are some questions that might help narrow it down. Okay, so did the symptoms come on gradually or suddenly? How long has it been since possible um, respiratory virus exposure? If I went to a party and I got sick the following day with fever and sore throat, what do I have? You know, is it, is it the common cold? Is it flu, COVID-19? Am I contagious and for how long? The only way for certain to diagnose which respiratory virus that you may have is to get tested. Testing is the only solid way to know. You'll know what, vi what respiratory virus you have, the length of incubation, you know, when to stay home and for how long. Should you 
be quarantined, you know, strict quarantine and what symptoms to monitor. Also, when you are definite on what virus you have, you can notify people that you were in contact with and let them be aware and monitor themselves or symptoms for, for symptoms. You know, they may need to stay quarantined from any family member who are frail and easily susceptible to the virus. So remember, you could be contagious and not show any symptoms. Okay. So the CDC created this dashboard, uh, RESPnet, and RESPnet stands for Respiratory Virus Hospitalization Surveillance Network. And this dashboard has three platforms that conduct population-based surveillance for lab-confirmed hospitalization associated with COVID-19, influenza, and RSV among children and adults. The rates um, presented on this dashboard uh, can be used to follow trends and compare COVID-19, you know, compare the, the uh, cases of COVID-19 and the flu and RSV and check the hospitalization rates um, in different demographic groups. Um, you could, you can, um, break it down by age, by sex, race, ethnicity, and across the seasons. And Abby will show the link for you to check this site out. It's, it's, really, it's really good stuff. Um, and, um, you know, the next slide right here, um, this is how you, you know, these are kind of the steps on how you can check it out. Um, so click on the link. You're going to select the topic of interest at the top. You can see, um, you know, season, age, ethnicity, and, and you know, which state. Um, hospitalization rates can be viewed as weekly or cumulative rates or for all, you know, any seasons, all the seasons. Um, you could select and filter of interest, you know, what type of pathogen you want to look up. You know, you could look up all of them. You could look up just one. Um, and you could also select the different ways to view the data. And it could be displayed in a graph, which is um, the default view, or um, as a, a tabular view, and you could right click and just kind of, you know, hover, you know, hover your mouse over it. And you could see how you could, I mean, you could just pick up a lot of different information. It's great. And um, on the side here, the black line indicates the combined number of cases. Um, so it's a combination of the RSV, the flu and the COVID-19 cases. The red line indicates the number of COVID-19 cases strictly. The blue line indicates the number of flu cases and the green line indicates the number of RSV cases. So again, um, Abby has that link up there. So, you know, check it out, see what's going on in your community and what's close going on close by. So when these viruses are spreading in the community, the risk for spread in the healthcare settings increases as well. And as we navigate through this respiratory virus season, there are things that you can do as a healthcare worker to prevent and slow the spread of infection. And this is where, you know, I'd like to ask you to participate and you can put your answers in the chat. What are some infection control actions that you do now that help to decrease the spread of respiratory virus? You know, what are some things that you do um, in your practice to, um, to help decrease the spread of virus? Hand washing, excellent. PPE, disinfecting, wearing a mask, excellent. Gloves, perfect. Education, yes. Those are all excellent answers. I appreciate that. So you all know some, some of these um, infection control actions. So now we're gonna go over some, some of you, some of them you have named and some um, we're gonna go over some new ones. Cover your cough, very good. So here are some infection control actions. Again, a lot of you listed these and there are a couple others that you haven't. So um, correct use of mask and respirators, yes, important. Cleaning your hands clean and disinfecting objects, practice physical distancing, vaccination, ensuring HVAC is maintained, and practice good healthy habits. And the good news is that we have, we all have the tools to prevent the spread of infection to others. And now we're going to go over each of these in a little more detail, okay? So correct use of masks and respirators. Consider masking as source control in healthcare facilities during respiratory virus season. Source control is an important tool to keep germs from spreading. It stops germs at their source before they can even spread to other people. Well-fitted face masks or respirators covering a person's mouth and nose can prevent spread of respiratory secretions when people are breathing, talking, sneezing, or coughing. It's recommended that source control be used by people with symptoms of a respiratory infection and also for those who were recently exposed to someone with a respiratory infection. The overall benefit of 
broader masking is likely to be the greatest for patients at high risk for severe outcome from respiratory virus infections. Facilities could consider expanding mask use to those situations. Um, you know, oper operationalizing broader mask use in facilities could include recommending, you know, healthcare workers use masks for certain types of patients or during the typical respiratory virus season. Use of masks and respirators by healthcare workers, patients, and visitors help decrease the spread of respiratory viruses. Even when masking is not required by the facility, individuals should be allowed to use a mask or a respirator if they choose to do so. Wearing a mask will help decrease the transmission of respiratory viruses, the ones we just mentioned today, COVID-19, RSV, the flu, and also the common cold, because they all spread by respiratory droplets. So these masks obviously can help block these droplets from being released in the air and breathed in by someone else. So when needed and used correctly, masks and respirators filter respiratory droplets as air is breathed in and out. And you wanna wear a mask to protect yourself, wear a mask that fits properly, and wear a mask the correct way. If your facility does um, decide to institute masking, Project First Line has created um, signs to help encourage masking. Um, and Abby will show the link and you can download, print and share that with your team, with your colleagues. Okay, so our next infection control action, cleaning your hands, which a lot of you mentioned in the chat. Hands are the main way germs spread in healthcare settings. Cleaning your hands regularly, regularly with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer or soap and water is a simple yet very effective tool to stop the spread of germs. It protects you and those receiving the care that you provide. You wanna clean your hands the correct way. Make sure there's consistent access to hand, san hand sanitizer dispensers and supplies for hand washing throughout the facility. If proper hand hygiene is not performed, germs can spread from person to person or from surfaces to people by the following. Touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Preparing food or eating food and drinks with unwashed hands. Touching surfaces or objects that have germs on them blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing into your hands, and then touching other people's hands or common objects. And here's a poster that sums up hand hygiene and disinfecting, and Abby will show the link to this poster. And again, you could download it and print it. Okay, so next, our third um, infection control action is cleaning and disinfecting. Cleaning is a process that removes things like dust, dirt, grime, and spills. Disinfection is a process that kills any remaining germs on the surfaces after cleaning. Regular environmental cleaning is necessary. Lobby areas, cafeterias, waiting rooms where there's high traffic spaces. Um, you know, clean commonly used objects often and clean commonly touched surfaces, right? Um, it's important to clean high touch surfaces, you know, pens, um, clipboards, doorknobs, elevator buttons. It's also very important to disinfect areas in your facility where people or patients that are ill are sitting, you know, waiting rooms or pediatric waiting rooms where, you know, sick children are playing with the toys. Disinfecting reusable devices such as shared medical equipment among patients, shared phones, those your, our computer, computer keyboards. There are so many objects that are touched by so many people in one day. So think of all the objects that you touch in your workplace, you know, so it's really important keeping on top of and frequently cleaning and disinfecting. Okay, our next infection control action is practicing physical distance. Physical distancing means keeping space between yourself and other people. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. And when you're sick, keep your distance from others to protect them from getting sick too. Encourage physical distancing, particularly in shared spaces, you know, where, where, it's, where you know, it could be crowded, you know, arenas. Um, also monitoring your um, elevators that you're taking, you know, check and make sure it's not overcrowded. Uh, monitor waiting rooms and assure patients are distanced. If a person is waiting in the area and appears to be ill and you see somebody that's ill with cough and congestion, you know, offer them a mask or if you are able to move that patient into a, you know, a single area if possible. Staying home from work or school if you are sick. And also utilizing telehealth, telemedicine appointments for patient care when appropriate. All of these strategies significantly decrease the risk of spreading illness. 
And our fifth infection control action is vaccination. We know that vaccinating is a public health measure that reduces the spread of infectious disease and also absenteeism. Currently, there is a vaccine for each of these viruses, which we discussed, and now we have them for all of them, right? RSV, we just we just got. Um, we have the vaccine for flu and vaccine for COVID-19. Um, talk to your PCP regarding vaccination. And also, it's very important to keep routine visits with, with your primary. Okay, another infection control action is ensuring HVAC maintenance is up to date. You know, as, as you go about your work day, see if any vents are blocked by an object that you can move away. You know, there might be a trash bin blocking a vent in an exam room. You know, move that trash bin away to assure for proper ventilation in the room. You know, think about how many patients you have that you're rooming, you know, so you want to keep that airflow circulating. Um, HVAC system, you know, you want to check and see your facilities management, ensure that the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is efficiently working. Um, it's good to have the knowledge and understanding of the ventilation and filtration systems where you work. And Abby will um, show a link um, to the poster on ventilation in healthcare settings. She's a great, another great resource. Thank you, Abby. And our last infection control reminder is practicing good health habits. Um, Self-care is one action that most of us do not do, nor do we put it high on our priority list. Getting plenty of sleep, being physically active, managing your stress, drinking plenty of fluids, and eating nutritious food, and staying home when you're not feeling well. Taking the time to do these things for yourself allows you to remain strong and healthy during your daily rigorous routines. Okay, so here's a recap of what we just went over, right? Infection control actions. Number one, again, correct use of masks and respirators. Cleaning your hands. Clean and disinfecting objects. Practicing physical distancing. Vaccinations. Ensuring HVAC maintenance is up to date. And last, practicing good, healthy habits. So as we end this refresher session, I like to have you all reflect and take a moment to think about this last question. And if you'd like to participate, you can put your answers in the chat. How can you help yourself and your coworkers take the correct infection control actions to keep germs from spreading the next time you see a patient coughing with congestion? If you want to share any answers there in the chat. You know, how could you, what would you do if you, you know, you saw a, a patient coughing with they're looking ill and they have congestion. You know, what are some um, steps that you can take to, pre to help prevent the spread? Mask and disinfect the area. Yes. Very good. Encouraging donning a mask. Yep. Perfect. Bring them back to a, 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 their own room. Tell them to go home and call their physician. <laughs> I like that, Mary. <laughs> Masking. Yes. Excellent answers. Very good. So we all own the duty to protect our patients by maintaining these actions in your practice, right? All right. So let's go to the key takeaways from today's session. So as we are now in the thick of respiratory virus season, being informed and prepared will help decrease the impact of respiratory virus hospitalizations in our healthcare system. Respiratory viruses are highly contagious, they spread easily, and they can cause serious infection to everyone, especially the immunocompromised, causing them to become more ill than others. Infection control actions decrease the spread of respiratory viruses. Having knowledge, this knowledge and the tools on how to decrease the spread of respiratory viruses is vital in your role as a healthcare provider. We know it's critical to practice infection control actions, right? and protect ourselves and our loved ones against the flu, COVID-19 and RSV. And just to leave you on this, remember, as we continue through this respiratory virus season, we are all starting from a place of strength. We hope that you use these resources um, and share this information with your coworkers, family, and friends, and stay safe and healthy. Okay, so, before we do wrap up, I'm just going to remind everybody again for your um, train, uh, certificate of training requirements. In order to receive your certificate of training, you must complete the pre-session survey that was at the beginning, participate in today's session, and complete that post-session survey. 
A link for the post-session survey will be sent to you uh, tomorrow, January 23rd, via email, um, and it will be available until midnight on January 29th. Once you complete the requirements, a certificate of training will be emailed in PDF form on February 1st. For EMS and dental providers, this can be used towards one hour of continuing ed credit. So please be sure if you are looking to receive CNE credit that you complete the post-session quiz, and that'll be emailed to you tomorrow with the rest of your post-session documents. And a copy of this um, PowerPoint and the uh, post-training resources will be emailed to you this afternoon. Okay, today's webinar um, is, I'm gonna be um, presenting this again. It's gonna be offered again this week. So I'll be presenting this again this Thursday, January 25th at 10, 10 a.m. So please let your staff and colleagues know if they were unable to attend today. And also my colleague, Jacob Peguero will be presenting this same session in Spanish language on February 5th at 12 noon. So help us spread the word to any of your Spanish uh, speaking colleagues. And you can pre-register for all these sessions anytime. And Abby will show the link to where you can register. And if you did not enter your email um, at the beginning, please feel free to enter your email now if you want to be added to our distribution list of upcoming trainings. And you could also connect with Project First Line Rhode Island team by emailing us if you have any questions. Our live events link through our website. And Abby will uh, post that into the chat box as well. And you can follow Project First Line Rhode Island on social media. Um, you know, we're on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And these are the references for today's uh, presentation. And last, I invite you to take this quick three, um, it's three question end of session um, poll here. This helps us um, with your feedback and, you know, continuing to meet your learning needs. And then we will go on to our Q&A if anybody has any questions. And I invite Dr. Kearney to come back on camera with me while we wait to see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, doesn't seem like there's any pressing questions today. Um, Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, if anyone has any questions as you're reviewing the slides later today or if something comes up, we're always available by email and would love to connect with you on any of our social media channels. So hope to see you in our future trainings and uh, stay warm.